Welcome to another Guitar Stuff This Guy Does video. This video is about my Red Hot Chili Pepper Squire decal project. This is the second time I have added a picture decal to the front of a guitar. I used an airbrush to add a buildup of paint to hide the edge of the paper, and then I used a clear coat to seal it all in. The first time I did this was the Pulp Fiction decal project. The main difference between this one and the Pulp Fiction one is that the paper I used on the Pulp Fiction project was a thicker 200 GSM paper with a high gloss, and this one was just plain matte printed paper. The other difference is that I did not use a graphic that required a clear pick guard to increase the real estate or the area needed for the graphic. I also painted the headstock on this one and added the Chili Pepper logo to it with an airbrush using a stencil. I actually really liked how they turned out aesthetically and tonally. I really think someone will get something out of watching this process I used, so I am happy to share it here on the YouTubes for all to see. So without further ado, um, here we go. I purchased this Squire Stratocaster through Gumtree, which is like Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist for trading mostly secondhand items with people in your area. I had high hopes of it possibly being an 80s Japanese made Squire, but it was made in China in 2002. The guy who owned it obviously took good care of it and it plays really well. Upgrading the pickups to a set of Mexican made Fender pickups I bought through eBay was well worth it. Now it has that classic Stratocaster quack. I was not originally planning on using the silver pick guard until I realised that it fits the colour scheme of the album cover art I was using. The only colours used on the cover art were black, red, white and silver. At the time I bought this guitar it was going to be used for the Pulp Fiction project, but I ended up using the next Squire I bought for that project. For the undercoat I used British Paints Prep 4-in-1. It mainly seals undercoats and primes, and is the undercoat colour, that's, that's the fourth thing, the, the colour. At this time I really hadn't figured out the benefits of either using water-based or oil-based undercoat paints. In this case I bought the oil-based paint simply because I wasn't really paying too much attention when I was at the shop buying it. So since this primer was oil-based, I had to stick with non-water-based paints moving forward. I applied two coats with a paintbrush, then I wet sanded it smooth, maybe up to 600 grit. Although I had done it on the Pulp Fiction project with a small airbrush, I considered removing the paint from a spray can to put it through the spray gun. But this seemed counterproductive to do that again. I went to the art supplies shop to explore more realistic options. After talking to the staff there, I ended up selecting a product based primarily on two constraints. Oil based and not enamel. All their acrylics were water based so they were ruled out immediately. I bought an oil based paint in a tube. The type of paint you would normally apply to a canvas with a brush. I thinned it as best as I could with mineral terps which is mineral spirits and then methylated spirits which is denutralized alcohol for y'all Americans to put it through the paint gun. The only major downside to using this paint was that it took about one month to fully cure. After reviewing the video, it looks like I only sprayed two passes. I'm sure it was enough to cover the previous layer sufficiently, but it would have been quite thin. So I'm very surprised that this paint took so long to cure. My cousin who studied art said that sometimes if laid thick like the artistic painters do to add texture and depth to their brush strokes, this kind of paint might even take up to six months to fully set hard. Now I'm not saying it was a big mistake, but I would not suggest anyone else do this and I will never use it again. I expected that as long as I could get the viscosity down enough to shoot this paint through my gun, I had a good chance of success. When I saw that a lot of the paint matter was clumping at the bottom of the container, even after stirring in thinners for 20 minutes, I was a little bit worried. I just strained it and whatever paint particles went through the strainer went through the gun. From the video I have it appears that I laid two passes all over, but there could be a chance that I forgot to turn the camera on for one of the sessions being that I was so nervous about using this gun for only the second time. 
Shooting the Pulp Fiction clear coat was the first thing I ever used this gun on, and it was the project just prior to this. The paint took about two to three weeks to dry properly. I would press my thumb where the neck plate goes to check its hardness. I would do this about once a week until I wasn't leaving much of an indent so easily. The fact of the matter is that I was always going to be able to leave a thumbnail mark, but I think it did get to an acceptable level of hardness to the point where you could call it dry enough to proceed with the next step. You are not really going to be able to tell from these shots how it would turn out, but this paint turned out to be very matte and felt a bit chalky to the touch when it dried. I would then wet sand it to make sure that it was flat before adding glue and the printout. I was more cautious this time when wet sanding because I didn't know how this type of paint would react to the process. So what you see in this video is the recording of me gluing down the polyester fabric. They offer this as a material for your print jobs at the print shop. I thought I would try this fabric because logically it would last longer than paper under a clear coat, but after five years I don't see any sign of it deteriorating in any way. This attempt to add the polyester print was a failure simply because I added far too much glue. There were bubbles and lumpy areas where there was excess glue. The idea was that I would intentionally add more glue than necessary and then squeegee the excess glue out. It didn't go quite as well as I thought it would. A few creases appeared in the fabric and later there was just no way to flatten them out. I didn't record myself removing the fabric printout or gluing down the paper version because I was a little bit angry and very disheartened by the situation. Since the process was exactly the same, except for how much glue there was, I am adding this to the video to show you how it was done. The final version was just the regular printer paper printout that I had made at the same time as the polyester print. From this point on, you will only see the plain paper version and not the polyester fabric one. After the paper was stuck to the body and the glue dried, I cut back the excess paper from the edges with an X-Acto blade. I used it to slice and scrape back the overhanging paper, making the profile of the paper edge as low as possible for the paint that would be added later to hide this transition. The images on the paper were pretty much unprotected except for this sheet of plastic paper I used to cover up the top surface. It was to protect the print from being painted on or damaged. The goal here was to hide the edge of the paper using paint. I used my airbrush to add paint around the edge of the paper and then I could sand it back to smooth over the transition with paint fused into the edge of the paper. According to some YouTube experts, paint is not a filler. However, in this video you will see how I've been able to use an oil-based paint enamel to build up enough paint matter to effectively use it as a filler. Either I'm very special, or they didn't mean all types of paint. Either way, fuck that guy. I proved him wrong enough to get done what I wanted to. Now, before I go on, I just wanted to address the elephant in the room. In these shots of me painting fresh white paint on old white paint, I have to admit that it's a bit hard to see the paint going on. I have zoomed in where possible to give you the best chance of seeing where the paint is hitting the body. To be honest, when you are watching it, it takes a trained eye sometimes to know when you are seeing the paint hit the body, or if it's a shadow, or a reflection of my hand, or the airbrush. After a while, it it does become a bit more obvious to see what's going on, but um, it's white paint on white paint. Adding these layers to the edge with the airbrush provided the next layer something to bond with. I kept repeating this process until the fluffy paper edges were smooth and the transition was no longer obvious. This was the magic trick I had to perform to make this project a success and hide any signs that this was paper glued to the body. I continued to use this sheet to cover up the paper until I added some polyurethane clear coat just to cover the printed images.
I used a masking process like a template to control where the clear coat went. I will actually talk more about that process when I'm up to that section of the video. I will also point out that the ink and images did somehow get damaged along the way, but it just added character to the overall look. I used dry sandpaper glued to small rectangles of rubber to smooth the painted edges when the paint had dried. I didn't do wet sanding because I didn't want to wet the paper. With the lighting situations I was working in, it was a bit hard to see where I was actually painting. Sometimes I had the sun setting in front of me which put a lot of glare in my eyes, or I was in the dark with a fluoro light behind me and I was creating a shadow for myself to work in. Sometimes I wasn't even sure if the paint was coming out, so this is why you would see me shoot the paint and draw circles on the plastic. Once I was sure the paint was flowing, I would start laying it onto the guitar again. I was actually using an oil-based enamel paint through this airbrush, which was thin with enamel thinner. The second time around, I was laying the paint down quite thick, just to flood that edge and give me something meaty to sand back. This decision was based on what I had learnt while sanding smooth the previous round of painting. By now I knew that it really did not matter how thick and rough it got laid down. Even runs really wouldn't matter, when it was dry again I could just hit it with sandpaper. It would help me conform to the natural curve of the edge of the guitar body. The more dried paint I had to work with the better, and the more it would cover the edge of the paper. This video is actually a long time coming. I finished this project four years ago just before I started the KISS Axe Base project. It's now 2021, and technically the Firebird SG guitar is still not finished. On a personal level, being that Pulp Fiction is my favourite movie, and the Chili Peppers album is my favourite album, I considered these two guitars as a set. If I had a man cave, they would be hung on the wall sideways for all to see, and ready to take down, plug in, and play when so inspired. Or, you know, whenever I felt like it. Now I know the Mod Podge method of transferring a printout onto a guitar, or a piece of wood, is a more straightforward and easier way to go about this. Even though I knew about that method before I started these projects, I decided that I wanted to try my own method, and just see how it turned out. In the end, both of my projects were successful, but looking back, I can see that you need a lot of patience to do it the way that I did this. Luckily, I have a ton of patience. Looking back at the video history to confirm the timeline of things, I was really relaxed about getting this Chili Pepper project done. The Pulp Fiction project came together a lot quicker. This was mainly because it was the first project of its kind that I was doing, and I had no other projects on the go that were a distraction. By the time I got around to this Chili Pepper guitar, there were a lot of distractions. Now, before anyone comments that adding a layer of paper to the front of a guitar would negatively affect the resonance of the guitar body, and uh, that you would disagree with using this method, just don't. I have set up a special email address for you to write to and express all your Tonewood opinions. It's thisguydoesn'tgiveadamn at yourface.com. I do apologise if that came across rather regressive, but I was just trying to get my point across. Thank you. Apologies for anyone who has been triggered. Anyone triggered can uh, use the email address that I mentioned just before. The Red Hot Chili Pepper decal project was supposed to be the project that I would complete after the Pulp Fiction project. I had the idea for both around the same time, and they were started close enough that I would swap the bodies that I would use with each other. The Pulp Fiction guitar project was the first thing I did in the way of putting a decal onto a guitar. And that was directly after I did the shitty sunburst. Oh, I, I mean, my first repainting adventure on the first Squire that I had bought. So here's the chronological rundown. 
The sunburst with spray cans was first. Then the Pulp Fiction decal with clear, with clear, with clear acrylic. Try saying that five times real fast. Pulp Fiction decal with clear acrylic pick guard was next, and then I started the Chili Pepper project. By the time I got the edges covered with paint, I started building the body for the first guitar that I would actually make. So this guitar actually sat on the shelf with paper stuck to it with no protection for about six to eight months. I jumped into making the Red Maiden Flamingo guitar body with cheap hardware store pine and then immediately started the proper version of the Maiden Flamingo when my Queensland Maple order arrived. Everything I have mentioned so far is already a video on my channel. Not long after I finished the Mate and Flamingos, a very close cousin of mine passed away. So I was devastated for a while, where I didn't feel like doing anything. Then when I started being active again, this was the best next thing to do, because it was halfway finished. Another part of the inspiration to finish this project was that I had talked to my cousin not long before he passed, about all the guitars that I had made, and that I had recorded it all with uploading the content in mind. So I was committed to follow through, finish it all, and then eventually upload all these videos. It was actually one of the last things that I discussed with him, and I feel that I should follow through on all of this for him. I'm sure he's looking down on me, just laughing, that it's been three years since I uploaded my first video, and I still only have about 50 subscribers. But that's okay. He always had a twisted sense of humour. And I would always forgive him for any joke he made about me. The very week that I finished buffing this Red Hot Chili Pepper guitar, I was showing photos of it to a friend, who I knew was into rock music like Kiss and 80s heavy metal. He asked if I would consider making a Kiss guitar for him because he is a massive fan and is collecting replicas of all of their guitars. Even though it seemed a bit ridiculous to me that I would become a custom builder after having only made two guitar bodies by this point, I was confident enough to commit to at least attempting to make any shape of guitar body. As long as I start with a decent body blank, I could shape a guitar body, no problems. I don't make necks, however, because I don't have the setup or tools in my modest little home workshop. So then he sent me a pic later that night. No, it was not a dick pic. It was the Gene Simmons Axe Bass. It's a monster of a fucking guitar. At first I nearly fell off my chair. I never actually seen it before. Actually, after looking at it and thinking about how I would approach it, I thought, challenge accepted. And now that's all history too. I never thought I would make a bass guitar, and that's even though I've played more bass than six string guitar. I now realise that I really don't have the drive to make any more guitars. However, if I do make one more stringed instrument, it will be my ultimate bass, just for me, but then I'm done. So as you can see, there was a little bit of an issue with the area where Chad is. 
Here's the second band member from the right above the pickup cavity near the belly cut. I pretty much decided to swap his section out using the spare printout. I think there was a rip or a crease which wasn't flat or removed some of the print. The layers of white paint added later flooded the seams so there was no bumps, but you can still see the cut lines on the paper in the finished job. My feelings on this is that a lot of the original printed content has been slightly affected one way or another throughout the painting process. Part of the tongue graphics have been covered, and the faded edges around the chili pepper logo have been covered. But in the end, it all just adds character to the whole thing. It gives it a roughed up and aged look to the graphic, all sealed up in a perfect glass-like clear coat. This is the phase where I am spraying the polyurethane clear coat just onto the printed images. I needed to add some more white paint where there was no printed images and cover the unpainted areas of the paper surface. The other motivation to do this was to try to cover the seams where Chad was replaced because the cutting line seams were more obvious than I thought they would be. I had to cover the printed areas with clear coat first before I went anywhere near the front of this decal with the white paint. Too much overspray on the wrong area of the print could have ruined the print and I would have had to replace the whole sheet again. It was insurance in case I accidentally painted on them. I could just sand back or scrape off the paint and reveal protected layers of clear coat underneath. First I made a reverse mask for blocking out where the white paint would go later. The clear coat and the white enamel paint were both oil based so I would not have adhesion issues, but I just didn't want to add the white paint over the top of the clear coat. I just cut the masking stencil so that the polyurethane clear coat would only cover the printed images. The week after, I would reverse the masking process and make masks to cover up all the images that now were protected by the clear coat, and then spray white paint to flood fill the remaining areas. This would sort of even out the layers. In my mind at least, it would make the printed areas level up with the painted areas. Once I had sprayed enough clear coat protecting the images, I stopped. There might have been about four to six passes. The paper would have absorbed the first few passes alone. In truth, I got to the point where the layers were so thick that the bottom edge of most clear coated areas was starting to bulge but did not actually form a run. These bulged areas would be sanded flat during the next wet standing phase after both clear coat and white paint areas were done. You can see already how much this polyurethane has a bit of a tint to it. It's actually a shade of purple in the tin and you will see it later on when I pour a mix of the clear coat for the paint gun. I hold the jar up to the camera and you will see how purple it looks. I don't know why it's purple, but when it's applied it adds this slightly brown tint. For this white paint, each layer added a few shades of a yellowish tint. In the end it gave the guitar a bone type colour. I don't want to say it was Olympic white because Olympic white is actually just a slightly off white. It just really gave it an aged, off-white look which I was surprised at at first. I really just wanted it to be bright white, but it didn't take long for me to see the benefit of the aged look in it and I accepted it. Now I really really love it, and I would almost do this again to give a new paint job an aged look without relicking it. Because I added more layers of the clear coat to the printed areas, those areas became darker and almost look like stickers that appear to have an extended bezel around them. Even though I was wet sanding with a flat block, some of the areas of the clear coat were thicker than the others, so were slightly darker than the rest. Now, I really love this guitar, and all the other projects that I have completed, but realistically I may have only picked it up and played it about 15 times in 4 years. It plays so well, and feels like a solid Strat, and sounds like one too. Having Mexican Fender pickup set in it really makes it sound more authentic than having Squire made pickups. I've had many Squires from various points across the 90s and the 2000s, but in comparison, 
the general feel and sound of this one is up there with my real Fender Strat. In a separate video you will see me change the pickups from a HSS set to the Mexican Fender SSS set that I bought second hand. For this changeover I had to modify the pick guard by making a plate to surround the single coil pickup in the bridge position where the humbucker rectangle is cut out. There will also be a video specifically for the painting of the headstock with the Red Hot Chili Pepper logo. So here you can see how much darker the clear coat has coloured the printed areas that I wanted to protect. You can see where the sticky tape was that held this template down, and the contrast between the unaffected white paint and the tint from just a few layers of the clear coat. This whole area will be flooded with another coat of white, so I wasn't too concerned about this area. That, that, that trick you told are just as good. You're, You're taking a very long view as if they were for the part. It's an action history. Yeah. Like this guitar here, every screw, nothing and bolt, capacitor, pot, potentiometer, even the switch, mm -hmm. that's what we make. Yeah. They don't do that. You know? You know, it, it's, it's you know, preserving this. Now, if this guitar is big, But because it's not, it's on the road. I played six songs in it. What have you done for this one? Are you threatened? No, they're, they're in the stock width, so they're not these big. They're just slightly taller than the original. In 58. This was the last spare copy of the printout that I had. I believed I ordered a material copy, which was scrapped and three copies of the printout on normal A3 regular matte printer paper. Because of the size, I could not print it at home on A4. To keep the paper masks from flopping around from the paint gun's air pressure, I stuck the image to some very stiff cardboard to give it plenty of support. I also glued some toothpicks on the underside which elevated these pieces away from the guitar face. This would allow a small amount of overspray 
but it would avoid a capillary action that could suck the paint under the cardboard if it were only on the face of the printed area, but not making perfect contact. If I did not think of this, at the end of spraying the paint, I would have been all happy and shit thinking that the cardboard protected the painted area, only to remove it and see that a river of paint was sucked beneath it and actually helped to contaminate the area that the cardboard was intended to protect. This might have happened only if I really laid the paint so thick that it would run. The word for today, kids, is capillary. These toothpicks and blue tack held the mask to the body, but away enough so that the coats of white paint would meet up with the edge of the clear coat that was laid with the reverse mask. In the end, this is just a method of controlling sprayed paint that I designed. I haven't seen anyone do this, and you can see that I developed this technique when I was trying to control the sunburst with the raised template method on my first ever project. Overall, I firmly agree that there are a lot better ways to get images onto the face of a guitar rather than sticking down paper to the body with glue. Many of you would have already heard of the Mod Podge method where the paper is dissolved and the ink stays in the Mod Podge glue in a thin layer on the body. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just search for guitar and Mod Podge. I knew about this method early on, but I just thought I would try it my way and later realized how much work this would end up being in the end. I am glad that I did it this way in the end because it turned out great and I am very happy with this guitar. I think I mentioned it earlier, but this is white enamel paint, which is oil-based and has been thinned with enamel thinner. Once this project had an oil-based primer on it, it was locked in and I could not use any water-based paints as there would be adhesion issues. That's just how paint works, apparently. The artist's type of oil-based paint out of a tube, which I sprayed onto the guitar before the images went on, cemented the use of oil-based paints moving forward. I had already told myself to never use enamel paints again after my experience with enamel spray can paints on the spray can sunburst Squire Strat. However, I figured that by using a paint gun it would keep the layers thin, it would dry quite tough, and I wouldn't have the same problems that I did with the sunburst Squire project. I think this paint was better quality than what I had used from the spray cans on the sunburst project because even though I'd laid it a little thick in some areas it set quite firm and glossy but did not become rubbery due to the thickness. I have actually already stripped the original sunburst guitar project and now it's in primer just waiting for me to start the painting process on it. I'm doing it at the same time as two other Squire bodies that I bought and have never done anything with, so I'm looking to refinish them and then sell them soon after. Being my first project ever, I was hesitant to undo all that hard work that I had put in, but I realised that I have all the learning and experience under my belt. I can do it again now with six more guitars under my belt and a truckload of confidence in how I will achieve a perfect paint job. I really want to keep my original Squire because it plays so well. I'm going to paint it a seafoam green or a surf green. Or it could just turn out turquoise and we'll just call it surf green. Another big inspiration to repaint is that I've got a real sunburst strat now, so looking at them side by side just made me cringe and think what a joke my can sprayed sunburst guitar looked like. 
I very easily convinced myself that I needed to erase it from existence. But I will keep the early videos up because it was part of my learning curve and that's what this Guitar Stuff This Guy Does channel is all about. When I started that first project, I just wanted to paint a convincing sunburst. I had no idea what I was doing and had never really picked up a paint gun or used spray cans much before. I was just a 30-something dude who used to mess around in garage bands, wanting to jump in and see what he could do with guitars. I just kept pushing myself to try new things I felt inspired to create. First it was the repainting, then it was adding decals, then it was making custom guitar bodies and painting them. If I had a professional workshop and materials were not a problem to obtain, I would consider making guitars every day and try to make a living from it. I just doubt that there is a market for another custom guitar builder in my area. So I would have been trying to get this paint as thick as I can to make it even with the thickness of the clear coat that I had put onto the printed areas below. I would have done about two or three coats and then come back 15 minutes later to give it another three coats and then repeat this process. At this point I had completed the red Maiton guitar, the real Maiton guitar and the clear coat on the Pulp Fiction guitar. The real Maiton was just stained by hand but added many layers of clear coat across my many sessions. I used the same oil-based clear coat spray on all these projects. With all of that experience setting up this gun to spray and the various outcomes I have achieved, I do believe that I have finally learnt how to set up the gun better. If you look at how this paint is coming out, there is way too much overspray. I always thought the pressure had to be up to 25 to 35 psi, and looking back at all these projects and seeing the video, I just know what I would tell myself. I mean, it's called HVLP for a reason. High volume, low pressure. It was written on the box. It was staring me right in the face from the day I bought it. I should have had lower pressure to get more paint on the project and less paint in the air around me. I bought a really good 3M mask now with filters. It is so good that I have done spray painting with a can and I could not even smell the paint. I put the mask on before I even took the cap off the spray can and had no idea what it smelt like until I took the mask off when I was done painting. They have such good filters, I'm so glad that I have finally put the money in and brought a decent mask to protect myself. The two Matons had their clear coat done at the same time, so I made this contraption that held two guitars at once, one on each side as you can see. This stand was ready to go, but what I've learnt was that this particular stand makes it really hard to get to the inside of the horns of a strat body with a paint gun. The Matons only had one horn, so being lopsided I didn't have much trouble there. The strat having two horns made it a real challenge to get in on the right angle to paint the inside of the horns effectively. At this point, the area under the mask already has clear coat on it. I was pretty much aiming the gun up into the gap between the masked edge and the printed area. So though they were already covered with clear coat, I was making sure that the edges overlapped. I didn't want there to be gaps between the white paint and the clear coat where the images were. It wouldn't have been a major problem. Having gaps would have simply required me to add more clear coat in the final stages. So it was no biggie.
Alright, this is a little bit of a story, but I'll try and get through it as quick as I can. Here we go. So you're probably wondering why of all things that I could put on a guitar, why did I choose the Red Hot Chili Peppers cover art from Blood Sugar Sex Magic? After I saw the videos on YouTube about adding a photo or a decal to a guitar using printout and Mod Podge, I started thinking about what I would put on a guitar. You could put a collage of oranges, or you could mock up a collage of band stickers rather than using expensive band stickers or hard to find stickers on your guitar. You could put a nice picture of a good looking lady on a guitar or a cartoon or a comic book character. So of all the things you could imagine, why did I pick this? Well, out of the two guitars I have done this to, Pulp Fiction came to mind first. Pulp Fiction is one of my favourite movies. It is easily always going to be in the top five movies of all time, in my opinion. Originally the idea was to put a black and white graphic just of Jules and Vincent with their guitars aimed at Brad. It's actually a picture used in the movie's promotional materials, but was never a camera angle actually used in the film. That's the idea I went to Photoshop with, but something different came out. So go and check out my other video about the Pulp Fiction decal project if you want to see that one. So the other idea I had was lining up the faces from the Chili Peppers album cover from Blood Sugar Sex Magic. I thought I had an original idea, but after I did some Google image search, I found that I was not the first person to think of doing this. So anyway, at the risk of being unoriginal, I thought I could do it better, or at least do it my own way. In which I did, I added a picture of the band and their logo at the bottom near the jack plate. So the Chili Peppers were my favourite band since I was 13. My favourite album of all time is Blood Sugar Sex Magic. I think I was about 12 when I heard Under the Bridge and Give It Away for the first time. I was mostly into a lot of hip hop and rap until then. I was into Van Halen and the band Poison and so rock and roll was something I was also into. Nirvana and Pearl Jam albums came out in 1991 but I'll admit that I was just catching up in 1992 being my first year of high school and I had a tape copy from my cousins who were big influences on my musical discoveries at that time. The alternative music scene and hip-hop were the main types of music I listened to until I was 19 and heard The Chemical Brothers, The Prodigy and Fatboy Slim in one weekend on Rage. So my musical tastes are varied and I'm even into Neil Young now that I'm a little bit older. I think Axis Boulder's Love by Jimi Hendrix is nipping at its heels, but Blood Sugar Sex Magic is still probably the album I've played the most end to end. It was the bass lines on Blood Sugar Sex Magic that actually made me want to play bass. I would crank up the bass end on my stereo's EQ just before the speakers would distort or crackle. Anyway, it was the most influential album for me. I compare all other albums to its greatness and not many come close. I can see that I'm totally biased on this, but I really just couldn't see any other movie themed or album themed guitar artwork. Not many other movies make sense to be plastered as a theme on front of a guitar. Well, I can't think of any anyway. I could see a few other classic albums artwork being on a guitar like Dark Side for example, maybe just the prism on a black guitar. But the Pulp Fiction movie just lends itself to the element and theme of cool, and Merzerlu was also played on a strat. And the cover of the Chili Peppers album, easily cut out and laid out across the top of the guitar, just works. I added the band pick and the band's logo as an afterthought, just to fill the empty space. And once I realised I'd sanded off the headstock, it became somewhere else that I could put more of the Chili Peppers theme, which ended up being the logo. In the end, I'm very attached to both of these guitars. If, if anyone wanted to buy this guitar from me, it would cost a lot to pry this actual guitar from my hands while I'm still alive. I love how it turned out so much that I would probably love it more than my actual Fender Stratocaster. That is a sunburst. I haven't got any other plans to make any other guitars or do any more decals like this. The only other thing I would want for this Chili Pepper guitar is maybe to get some autographs on it especially now that John is back in the band. I would have to buy VIP tickets for an encounter with them where I could show them what I've done and ask for autographs, but at this point, that is just a dream. So I hope you can understand why this art was the pick that I put on a guitar and can respect my decision.
At the beginning of every spraying session, I wipe down the surface of the body with a cleaning agent. Or a gleaning agent, as per my fucking typo. I started with Windex window cleaner, then I started buying isopropyl alcohol in a spray bottle, which I don't really think is the right stuff anyway, but it, it cleaned well enough. I would then use lint-free paper towels to wipe them down. Then I would let it sit for at least two minutes to dry off, and then maybe spray it all over with an air blower attachment from my compressor. Or just the paint gun. You know, with the trigger only pulled far enough to let the air through without releasing any paint. Recently I bought a specific wax and grease remover product from the auto shop. I will use that in future. This is where you will see how the clear coat that I used is tinted purple at least when it comes out of the tin. This is just an oil-based polyurethane that comes from the hardware shop in a tin. It's mainly a product for coating projects made of wood. I haven't looked into using car grade clear coats or two pack paint products. Most people wouldn't notice this tint happening when they use it on natural or stained wood. I never expected it to make a noticeable difference and I really only realized the impact after spraying over this white paint for the first time. After the second coat, it was really starting to turn a very off-white or a bone color. It was uneven shades across the different areas depending on how thick I laid the clear in different areas, combined with how I would have wet sanded some areas more than others, leaving thicknesses uneven. So all over the body, there are slightly different transitions of lighter off-white to creamy vanilla, or a bone colour. I quite like the way it turned out in the end. Looking at that spray, I really did not have the gun set right, but that's to my standards that I hold to myself today. I will admit that there is one benefit of so much overspray like this because the more atomization that occurs, the layers would be thinner. This actually reduces the chance of causing runs a fair bit. So in short, it would release the paint in a more controlled way. This might have actually been beneficial to a beginner like myself at the time. This was back when I still became very nervous and anxious when it came to spraying the paint gun. When I watch these videos back, I also see many things I'm doing wrong. It has helped me learn from what I see and reinforces aspects that I will approach differently in future. But again, this is probably just all coming from being more experienced. I will spend a little more time setting up the paint gun a bit better these days. I have more of an idea about how I want the product to spray out and what I want to achieve. The first change I will be making is to lower the pressure as low as I can, then raise it until the paint is flowing out without excess overspray. Lowering the pressure was something that I was afraid to do because early on, I believed that you had to set the pressure flow to the gun for at least 25 psi. And I would just keep holding myself to this. Experience has taught me otherwise. I would have picked up this from YouTube, however they might have been using different types of guns that are not HVLP, or they were, but I interpreted their instructions incorrectly. By this point in my journey, to avoid runs, my method was just to make three passes all over and then wait two to three minutes and then add three more coats and repeat. This sounds excessive to me now, but with so much of the product going into the air as overspray and with that causing these layers to be so thin, it was an okay situation. If I were to set the paint gun to have lower pressure and more product hitting the project, I would have had to hold back more, keeping the gun moving and maybe only do two passes and then wait 10 minutes before going again. This is what I have already had success with on my later projects like the Axe Base and the SG Firebird project. I have almost eliminated my chances of causing runs in the paint. Of all the various paint and clear coat sessions on the Axe Base, maybe seven, I maybe only had one run maybe two. And with the SG Firebird project with maybe five sessions, I can't recall any noteworthy runs happening. This was nothing like what I had experienced on my first three projects using the paint gun. 
So it took a lot of patience to hit it, go away for a few minutes, come back for three more coats, wait a couple of minutes, hit it again, etc. I've learned that you should repeat this until that you are happy that there are sufficient coats, but that it's not so thick that the first coats won't dry and moisture is not being trapped. Also, if you just keep going on the same day, you are bound to get a thickness of wet paint that there will be runs or sagging. The spraying sessions on this project were the best that I had had to date. They resulted in the perfect amount of layers being applied, so I didn't risk cutting through when wet sanding the body before the next painting day. During the application of these first few coats, you might be able to see the daylight reflecting off the face as I am painting it. You might be able to see some high and low areas that will eventually be flooded out with heavier layers later on. One month later, when it would most certainly be cured, I would sand it all flat as I can and even it all out. Seeing that chain of attachments under the gun reminds me of how bad that situation had become. So the first attachment is a pressure gauge so I know how much pressure I have at the gun. I can't get rid of that one, but the next one down is an oil and moisture trap. Under the water trap is the adapter required to attach the hose, and that hose is about half inch thick, so it's quite heavy. I believe this thickness of hose is needed to provide sufficient airflow but I could buy a lighter, more flexible hose. The issue with such a long chain of attachments is firstly, the many connections introduce opportunities for air leaks. The next problem is the weight and stiffness. The weight of the hose combined with the straightness of all those attachments limited maneuverability, and I was constantly fighting to turn the paint gun on any kind of angle. I have since put another style of filter at the compressor end of the hose. I'm probably going to leave the pressure gauge on the end, but I will also move the oil trap down to the compressor end of the hose to rectify these issues.
So I've really been quite slack on the editing and uploading of these videos for you all to see. This Chili Pepper project was finished around August 2017, and I'm revising this narration now in October, November, and December 2021. The Kiss Axe base was finished and handed over to the owner on December 2nd, 2017. I just uploaded the videos for it in August 2020. My first demo of the SG Firebird places its bodywork completion in September 2019. I've all but finished the paintwork now, except I want to add a painted decal and then clear coat it once more. I also have to make the back cavity cover plates. Yeah. At times I've been focusing my times and efforts on a few other home projects that are not guitar related, such as building a display cabinet for my action figure collection. It now has three guitar holders on each side, so now it is guitar related in that sense, but I didn't bother recording any of that process. So sometimes I need to build something that's not guitar related, and won't do any video of that project being completed at all. Something just recently inspired me to knuckle down and get a decent narration done so I can just get them uploaded. A lot of editing for a few projects are done, but the narration and final touches take a lot of work. I might also have to do a little bit of a demo so that you can see how it turned out overall and what it looks like five years later. Inside the back cavity, you might be able to see the red paint there. This is actually a test of a stencil that I made for the original Sunburst Squire that said, fuck up, in the Fender font. It was when these bodies were still in white primer, and I would have used a red spray can because I don't think I had my spray guns until I was up to the clear coat phase of the Pulp Fiction project. I would have covered it up with some tape when spraying more white layers on it. It now hides behind the springs for the tremolo, so it really can't be seen now anyway, even though I don't have a back plate cover on it anymore. I think I destroyed the back cavity cover off this guitar to make the pickguard modification so I could install the single coil pickup where the humbucker used to be on this pickguard in the bridge position. This would be a good time to mention the wooden arms that I made to hold the guitar in the stand that I put together using a speaker stand. I just rounded the end of the wood so it fit into the cardboard tubes on each side of the stand. The handle helps me rotate it without touching any of the wet paint on the guitar body. I have to wear a glove on that hand because the handle usually gets paint on it in the process. I intentionally avoided aligning the screws with where the neck screws go and I added these plastic washers on the inside of the stick to raise the stick away from the back of the neck so the paint would not form a link to the stick. I had to super glue these things in. At this point you can see how bone coloured the body has become. When the clear coat went on it was quite clear and the white paint still looked white. It changed colour as the clear coat cured. This would have been quite a short wet sanding session as there was very little orange peel or unevenness to the finish. If you want to see a really good example of what the wet sanding process actually does, there's a video on my channel about wet sanding from when I added the clear coat to the sunburst project with a paintbrush. This is why it's a good example, because you can actually see the difference as I go through the different strengths of sandpaper, from harsh to fine, and sand back what I call hills to level the surface down to the bottom of the valleys. On this guitar it was still required, however on this round of clear coat there was very little orange peel to deal with. 
Wet sanding a strat body would normally take me two to four hours, depending on how many grits of sandpaper that I had to go through. And this is clearly sped up and is condensed into the next four minutes. So enjoy. Or skip it. I don't care. Looking at all that overspray, I am again reminded that this was the first paint job where I did not overdo it and cause any runs. From memory, I still believe that this paint job had no runs, or at least in the clear coat phases. On most of the paint jobs before this one, there was usually a run here or there that I had to sand back and deal with when the clear coat had dried. I remember a very bad run on the Pulp Fiction video I even made a point of it in the video for that project. There was one on the back of the good maiden body that took three clear coat sessions before it was dealt with. But considering the amount of overspray on this one and how cautious I would have become, I would call this the first project where I was able to avoid runs in the clear coat during all sessions.
You can see the orange peel effect there when you look at the shiny bits in the light. It would look a bit different when it dries, but that's pretty much what it looks like when it is dried. I would just have to wet sand just until those pits all became flats, and then polish it with a buffing pad. I kept this hung up for at least a month before I sanded and polished it. I really wanted that polyurethane to be as hard as it was going to get before I sanded it. Obviously, I must not have recorded the last wet sanding. I'm just moving on here to the buffing and polishing. I've found that once I have wet sanded to 400 grit sandpaper and everything is flat, I could move on to buffing. I don't know why, but it just works. I use Meguiar's polishing compound and you will see the bottle there. The only annoying thing about buffing the guitar is trying to do the edges, but I do have the right buffing tools to put on the end of the drill. It works for me, and it is actually cheaper than buying an actual buffing machine. Many of my guitars have come up so shiny that I've never felt the need to buy an actual buffing machine. Every guitar I've done with this method and tool has come up 100%. In the cutaway you can see the reflection of the light, or the wall, or something. It's it's very nice and shiny.
You may have noticed this rectangular fence around the area where I am buffing. Well, if you didn't, I'm bringing it to your attention now. It is there to catch the splatter of liquid compound that flies off the buffing pad in all directions. If you don't have one of these, the room will become contaminated with random droplets that could get quite messy. The splatter that you see on the inside of the fence is the build-up of five different buffing sessions prior. This attachment is my secret weapon for getting into the most awkward parts of the horns and the sides of the body. I just use this drill bit mounted buffing cylinder. I always add masking tape or painter's tape around the truck. This is to protect the body and the fresh paint job from that nasty jagged spinning metal chuck. Imagine what damage that type of chuck could do if it were to dance around the edge of your guitar. It would absolutely tear through the paint, it would tear through the polish, and it would tear through the polyurethane and put a nasty chunk into the edge of your guitar. So while it's a smart idea to use these buffing attachments, it's even much smarter to protect the shit out of your guitar from this drill chuck if you were to lose control. I feel 100% confident that this would prevent the chuck from hitting my guitar body.
I get these buffing attachments from my local auto shop. They are just drill attachment bits that have cotton cloth bunched up at one end. They are held with a screw and washer to the end of a chuck drill bit. They are quite cheap and I usually just buy one new one each time I start a project. One of these Meguiar's bottles usually lasts for about five guitar bodies. I'm always impressed at how shiny and glass-like the finish turns out at the end of the buffing session. It's not bad for just a paper printout job stuck to a guitar with glue. Many would say this would dampen or some way affect the tone of this guitar. Being at the low end of guitar production and craftsmanship, I don't think a thin layer of paper is going to make a noticeable difference to the tone. Especially when the overdrive is on. There will be another video where I convert the original HSS pickguard into an SSS capable pickguard. I could have just stayed with the stock Squire made pickups, but I'm very glad that I installed the second hand Mexican Strat pickups. I really hope that you like seeing this project. Check out the next two videos, which should be released sometime soon, in which there will be a pickguard conversion and the paint job on the headstock, where I use stencils and an airbrush to add the Chili Pepper Star logo to the headstock of this guitar. I hope you are all well. I hope you all stay safe. I will see you in the next one, and until next time, have a bloody good one.